Today, I am joined by Pam, who is the founder of Incredible Edible, a grassroots global movement of people reclaiming their food prosperity. Welcome, Pam. My first question for you, Pam, is what your catalyst was for starting Incredible Edible. We don't always have flashbulb moments, but I just happened to have one and it was nothing to do with me whatsoever. It just happened. Uh, And I was in London and I was in an event where Tim Lang was speaking, uh, professor of food policy at the time at uh, UCL. And he was talking about the use of planetary resources. And he was talking about he used to be a meat farmer, beef farmer. um, And he got out of that for all the sorts of reasons about um, the climate and he was just talking. It was all so terribly depressing. And oh, my God, we're going to hell in a handcart and all that stuff. And I just sat in the audience. I thought, oh, bugger this, you know, because I sat through Rio and waited for them to do something. I'd sat through Kyoto and waited for them. to. Do. I know a lack of leadership when I see it. So I thought, well, what the hell? Why don't we just have a crack ourselves? Because I just can't go through life feeling so despondent. So that was it. It was just a flash moment. And um, and I thought, well, let's see if we can find some way of, of motivating folks. There, is there a unifying language we can find that would motivate people to maybe just think they could do things differently? Slowly, slowly. And, and it was fairly obvious to me that that was food. Because, you know, I have sat through people banging on about peak oil and people banging on about all manner of things that leaves the average family kind of like in the dark about what they can do but if you talk about food you talk about food that you can cook enjoy shop for talk to your granny about get your kids talking about whatever if you can do that maybe you can start to believe that you can start to live your life differently so that was the flashbulb moment when it struck me and what came into my mind was an absolute knowledge that people are incredible when they are given the chance to do something beyond their everyday. You know, the pictures that you see of mothers in a crisis lifting up cars so that their kid can get out from under it. These people, these are ordinary folks. We will walk on water for our children. Why don't we give everybody the chance to be part of a grassroots revolution, why don't we do that? So that's when we invented Incredible Edible. Where is Incredible Edible today? Well, <laughs> all over the shop, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so it started in in my hometown, uh, 15,000 people in the north of England, only because there is no point in starting on something you can't get your hands on. So um, I invented this really simple model Let's imagine we're spinning three plates because it has to be a bit of action theatre. Let's imagine we're in a Chinese circus and we've got plate spinners. And the first plate is about community and food, passing it every day. So suppose we planted food all over the place in the place we call home. And then the next plate was learning. Forget about fighting the curriculum. Forget about it. It's debilitating fighting the curriculum. Let's see what we know in, this, in the community. Let's see what our elders know. Let's see what our young people know. Let's see what the visitors to our shores know. Let's see what the lonely know. Let's have a chat about how to cook well, how to grow, how to pickle and bottle and graft and do whatever we need. And then the third thing was, let's see if walking through places you can eat food from every day and places that you know who will be able to show you what to do with that food. Just maybe we'll go to a local market and ask about something local. Maybe we'll buy local cheese when we didn't think about it before because we only went to a supermarket. Maybe we'll have a chat with the butcher if we eat meat um, and ask about the welfare of the animals. Maybe we'll just do that because we're not trying to hurt people by shopping in supermarkets. It's just convenient and we'd never thought to do it any different. Mm. So where Incredible Edible is spinning its three plates um, is in Tombedon and 150-odd other communities over the UK and in neighbourhoods all over the world just doing their thing in some way. And because it's grassroots and because it's not got any kind of uh, membership other than if you eat, you're in. <laughs> and and it's because it's about, you know, just saying let's learn from each other. We've learned a lot over 150 years about how people can change how their neighborhoods look, 
how people can get a greater sense of pride because it was they that created that, not anybody else coming down from on high with a degree somewhere, that they have learned new skills they never knew before and they've talked to complete strangers because food is kind of like such a unifying mm. conversation and they've welcomed people into the community that they've not before. And with all the stuff we've been learning over the past 11 years, because it was always going to be a long haul. We were going from, you know, ground zero with no resource whatsoever, just with the will to do it and to tell stories. And it's all about telling stories. So where we're at at the moment is to get the other hand clapping. Mm. The community's done its clapping. Now, who out there wants to make this normal? And that's where we're up to. Amazing. And why do you believe we have become so disconnected from our relationship to food? And how is this reflective of the other ways in which we've become disconnected from ourselves, from our communities and from the natural world? I think it's just an inevitable consequence of we've never had it so good. You know, um, we've become we become selfish when a nation judges its success on gross domestic product what are you going to do and 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 we've forgotten that money is only a means to an end it only saves us from carrying one sheep to another sheep and doing a swap we've become obsessed with the dominance of that as the only factor that shows worth in a society despite the fact mm. that every time somebody close to you dies you don't think about that you don't think about whether you're going to go to the funeral, whether they've got the right quality of car on. It all, and but then we slip back into the mold that says we're judged by how we look, we're judged by how much money we've got in the bank, we've, and yet none of this at the end of the day matters. It's kind of a, sl a steady slippage of something that's always been there. What's always been there is a very small number of people controlling a very large majority of people. We've not invented something new. It's not just come over the horizon. It suits the way that we generate prosperity or define it by letting that happen. But ultimately, when the trump card is climate change, you have a right to call it out. Mm. When the trump card is the poor are going to be infinitely worse off than those that can buy themselves out of it. Mm. When the ability of those families that haven't had a great deal is as great as anybody else to live well and prosper if they've got a chance. This has got nothing to do with, you know, right, left, old politics, new politics. This is all about decency mm. and compassion. It's enough to say we've got to where we are. Um, and most people didn't do it out of any intention to hurt. They just got mesmerized with the with the story of this different tomorrow. So the key is, forget about that, what are we gonna do now? Mm. From now on in, what are we gonna do that prepares us for a future where everyone has a chance to live well and prosper? And remember, we don't do it alone. There are some great people in our communities who wanna help. There are some amazing gifts in our children and our elders that nobody's tapping into. And it just makes you happier. We have a card to play and it's our card. How is your own relationship to power um, changed in the time that you've evolved Incredible Edible? And perhaps your perception of things like sovereignty and things like ownership and decentralization. How has your own perception kind of shifted and where do you feel we all need to shift collectively to really become custodians of the solutions and not feel as if sure. we're beholden to, as you said, it's people in question. closed door rooms making it's decisions. Ultimately, it's up to us to stop being a victim, stop waiting for permission, permission stop saying I can only do it with money, do it with the gifts that you've got because you've got them, just play them and see where you go. So the book stops mm. with the individual, but sometimes you just have to shine a light on what those gifts are because people forget. I'm an economist by training, which kind of showed me that <laughs> that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I don't do anything about that. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I was a local political leader um, in a northern metropolitan borough. 
And then I chaired a hospital trust and I became on some national boards around the environment and rural society and eventually ended up at the Forestry Commission. And uh, so I kind of have a reasonable knowledge of how folks from the local to the national operate and they're all the same. They're all the same. They've got their families. They give us stuff about their kids. So, so I start from a position that there's no, you know, the people around the board table are as likely, given the right circumstances, to do the right thing as the reason people around the kitchen table. I start from that proposition. Mm. You've got to find a way to do it. Because we were all born into this world exactly the same. So it's the system that we have a problem with, not the individuals. There are exceptions. I <laughs> don't doubt, but they are the exceptions. Mm. So knowing that those people were on the hospital board and the local authority board and the national government cabinet and all the rest of it were kind of constrained in this groundhog day of doing things the way that we've always done it. The only way to break through that when you've got nothing mm. is to use your gifts and demonstrate an alternative proposition and then tell the story. Mm. In a way that now you can tell stories, uh, uh, we couldn't have done it 30 years ago. You've got social media, you've got all manner of ways of getting through with the message. And the message will strike home to the willing and the able, and they're always there. They may not be in the majority, but they're always there. So when I was in local government, and I love my people in local government, they were fab and we did some great things, but we kind of thought we were the bee's knees. We thought... It, it all began and ended with us when it doesn't. Mm. We're a piece of the jigsaw. Mm. Just as each and every one of us is a piece of the jigsaw. Yeah. And so for the last 11 years, I've been demonstrating an alternative proposition that says, if you look at what we're doing with little but our will, don't you think this makes sense if we're trying to create healthier societies more connected societies, societies who want to understand the importance of soil, mm. who want to understand the importance of everybody having a right to good food. If we're going to do that, let's not write a book about it. Let's not, you know, write a theoretical paper. Let's just do it. Mm. And, and, and actually, you don't need to ask permission to turn a horrible bit of land into a herb garden with food to share. You do not need people's permission to do that. I have never known anybody shot as a result of doing this in 11 years. So I think you need to demonstrate an alternative proposition and then you need to put it out there and then you just need to watch where the blue touch paper's been lit and it will have been lit. Mm. And people, you know, and we've been contacted by all manner of people, by people, you know, all over the globe who said, I've been so worried about what to do and, and, and I know it's not the solution, but now I'm going to grow food in my box and I'm going to share it. And that makes me feel better. And yeah. that's the start. You cannot do it yeah. if you feel there's, there's no way out of this dilemma. Yeah. I talk about two hands clapping. What do I want? I want the people who are in charge of the frameworks of our lives to start to think about those frameworks, start to think about how they invest our money, start to think about how they use their assets, start to think about the relationship their people have got with the, with the citizens on the street and just start to do it differently and don't be frightened about it mm. because we can't be doing it much worse than we are at the moment. So It's a low baseline. I tell the story. And this wonderful doctor in Halifax in the north of England, wonderful doctor who is, you know, head of his practice and chair of his clinical commissioning group, which is great, just said, I want to do that, Pam, you know, and, and we can't wait. We can't wait for people to try and find enough time in their diary for doomsday. So he said, I've got a, I've got a doctor's surgery and it's in a real mixed community with its own challenges. Great people from all walks of life, from all cultures, all ages. Why don't we just turn my doctor's surgery into a propaganda garden? A, a, and a propaganda garden is a place that we take over, grow food in and share it. That's yeah. what we call them because they start conversations. <laughs> so why don't we just do that? So he puts out, he knocks on people's doors. This is a really, really busy doctor. Yeah. And at the first meeting, 15 people turn up. At the second meeting, 30. And last Saturday, more than 50 people turned up, yeah. right? From little people to elders. 
this wasn't the domain old ladies. This was a whole <laughs> mixed community from all walks of life to turn over what is a car park into a fabulous green, you know, uh, urban farm. They've stuck notice boards up to say, what do you want to do and what's your gifts? They've brought trees that they can plant. They've got herbs that they want to plant. They cook up a storm for lunch when everybody's done that. Yeah. And sometimes it's raining and sometimes it's not. And all it took was that doctor to say, we're going to do it. Yeah. I feel like you beautifully embody the expression of beg for forgiveness rather than asking for permission. Absolutely. <laughs> and yet you do it in a way that isn't alienating or divisive. You're very much about how do we create a better invitation for people to subscribe to. And I, I it's something that I come into conflict with a little bit, working with some of the young kind of climate strikers, uh, because it's very easy to fall into that, you know, us versus them mentality when you say, okay, well, system equals bad, us equals good. And, uh, you know, the only way to change is through brute force. Sure. How did you navigate that sort of dilemma well i'm old clover <laughs> right so as long as we start with the fact that i'm old <laughs> and i've been around a few blocks it helps um you know i'm not saying that you never need a battering ram mm. i'm just saying that's not where you'd start yeah i'm saying that if you want people to engage the rats in a corner mm. don't behave well mm. so don't put them in a corner Find a way that they can say yes. Hmm. So, and if, they, if you can't find a way for them to say yes, don't ask. It's really simple. It's really so, good advice. <laughs> <laughs> if we keep wearing this, we're better than you mentality in some way. That's, that's not a great investment in anybody's future. All I can say to people is, if you can be engaging, if you can bring humor into it, even though it's dire... If you can find the smallest thing that we can do together, then from that, we've got the never-ending story. Going back a long time, 10 years plus now, I'd say, we took over some unloved land in front of a derelict health centre. Mm. And that was the health centre that Harold Shipman, who was a notorious guy who killed people, doctor, uh, he practiced there for a while. Now, it was just unloved, and we built some raised beds at the front, and we planted some food. The point of the story is I we never asked permission to do that. I spoke to a lady from the health authority about six months later, and she said, I'm so pleased you've done that. I wish everybody would do that. That's made that place look so much better. That's what we should be doing, mm. right? Now, she couldn't have started it, but she gave it a fair wind. So I just think it's, it's an engaging approach. And if ultimately what we want is to build a critical mass around an alternative consensus, mm. then we need everybody in that tent, not just a few of us. A lot of what keeps us stuck in place is fear and fear of the unknown, fear of uncertainty. And it only takes 10 minutes on Twitter to be in a total slump because yeah. of the catastrophization and the depressing news. And if you look from a psychology perspective, I think it's something like for every you know, one piece of negative news, we need 10 pieces of positive news to kind of keep the balance, right? Mm. How do you manage those conflicts and feelings within yourself and how do you help more people unshackle from the fear and appreciate the kind of absurdity of how short of a time we have on this planet and how important it is to work in service of something that is bigger than yourself in service of contribution i cry a lot i don't cry in public a lot and it's okay because it is not good news and i am not a fool mm. But that also drives me because whether or not we're too late for mitigation, we sure as hell aren't for adaptation. And we have got to build the strength in our communities across the piece to do things differently. 
Stop flying food from places that could eat their own food. People have a chance to build a consensus that's an alternative proposition mm. and demonstrate. And we've seen it work. We have seen it work. I'm not investing in growing food. I'm investing in people's self-belief that they are a part of a solution to what we're passing over to our children and that we need to prepare ourselves. And if we can make it better, we will. But if we can help them adapt, we will also do that. Mm. Then I read things and God, it made me cry. And it was fantastic. It was tears of joy. So I'm, I, I scroll down. I only ever do it once a day. I scroll down on the Beeb kind of like, you know, <laughs> on my phone. What are the headlines? And it's invariably something too awful in America. But anyway, this wonderful professor from Sheffield who is using hydroponics to grow food in the Syrian camp in Jordan. This guy, this professor, had been doing hydroponics growing in a non-soil base. So with the nutrients in the liquid, he was growing food. He saw this stuff that was going on with 90,000 people, also phenomenal number of people, Syrian refugees in a camp in Jordan. It's a city. It's huge. What have they got, he discovers? Loads of waste. And the waste is basically the foam rubber bits from the mattresses that must only last so long. They've got... They've got shed loads of them. He thinks I can do something with that. So he goes over with his students and he shows people, and many of these wonderful people from Syria are from all professions, but some of them are farmers. Mm. And what they do over time is they grow food in these foam sheets. Mm. So now they are actually taking the, taking the foam Soaking it with the liquid, using a lot less water than you would ever do if you were trying to grow food in a desert. And from it, food is growing. And they have now got the farmers inspired to say, this is a new way. We can actually bring back green into this desert area. And this guy at the end said, and I felt for him because it's what I feel. There's never anything more important that I've done in my entire life than this is what he said. And isn't it a shame that we are, have schools in this country that dismiss urban farmers and the people that are learning how to grow in difficult circumstances as in some way being the non-achievers. Mm. Isn't that a shame? Mm. And isn't that wrong? Having a conversation about what's an important skill set. How do I connect with people? Giving more airtime to creativity. Mm. Not having a system that is dominated by tick boxes that makes really decent people who are teachers mm. do things in a way they don't want to do it. Mm. Loosen it up. We are not cogs in a wheel for a factory that has now become defunct. What we want is innovators, inspirers, people who can believe in doing things differently and who can redefine prosperity for us. Yeah, We're teaching students to become sets of averages and cogs in a machine that the climate crisis and ecological crisis tells us is fundamentally broken. Yeah, it, it is. But I just, I go back to this, can we light a blue touch paper somewhere? Mm. You know, think about what we're doing. We are growing food. We are talking to strangers. We are respecting each other across age and income and culture and ability. We are we're doing all these things right, like all, and all we're doing is thinking about food and how we can nourish ourselves and change the way it looks and whatever it might be. We haven't been employed by the National Health Service to set up a sustainable healthcare service, but we are. That's exactly what we are doing because we've got people who are more physically active, feel more mentally engaged, mm. are eating better diets are feeling they're a part of something. Mm. We have an offer that's a grassroots offer to the NHS that said, why don't you back this initiative? Why don't you just back everybody doing this? Mm. We have a health service that is populated by the most wonderful people, but it's not sustainable. It's not fundable. Mm. We have people walking into doctor's surgeries who are lonely who have lifestyle-related illnesses, who, who, who feel stress and anxiety in all manner of things. And the health service can't afford to deal with them. Mm. We've also got a climate change crisis where we're going to have um, the sorts of diseases, communicable diseases that we thought we'd got rid of, coming over the horizon. Mm. 
we're seeing it now, right? So wouldn't it be a whizzle idea to invest in grassroots, ordinary folks living their lives differently? You could do it in a number of ways, but let's take the incredible edible way. Getting more active, eating more food, understanding how to look after themselves, what, knowing how to cook, knowing how to pickle, knowing how to graft a tree so they can create an orchard at low cost. Wouldn't it be great if we took those people out of the system mm. so that when that awful bug comes from wherever it comes from, our doctors can afford to actually look after people who mm. really need us? That is a no-brainer. That is how you deliver sustainable healthcare. Mm. Living in London, I'm hyper-conscious of how different the social contracts are versus growing up in a tiny town of 6,000 people in far north Queensland in Australia or even growing up in Bali and in Indonesia where it's very much about the village mentality and no one is left behind. Mm. I'm hyper-aware here of feeling very disconnected, people constantly operating from a sort of fear mindset you know, disconnected from themselves. Their bodies are just vessels to get from point A to point B. Mm. And that can feel really overwhelming and it's easy to get sucked into that mm. kind of vortex of just being in a highly reactive state mm. at all times mm. and the loneliness that that carries with it. How can we bring some of this <laughs> magic that you're creating through Incredible Edible into spaces like this? And how do mm. we gain that kind of perspective so that we can see the bigger picture and we can kind of unlatch and unhook from the craziness of 21st century living, which is constantly reinforced, obviously, by the phone in my pocket and needing to be switched on and needing to be responsive across six different social media <laughs> platforms. How do we ground ourselves? How do we how do we deepen our roots? My entry point to that is we we just have a little piece of a jigsaw ourselves. So rather than worry about the big thing, let's see what the little thing we can do has to offer. And then let's use our imagination to see what asks, mm. what asks we can get out of that. For those of us that are in a position to do it, let's make a new normal. Let's make a new normal where we can. Then let's tell the story. Let's connect with other people who are doing a new normal and let's see where that takes us. And it ain't going to happen overnight because we have had decades of disconnect from a sense of community, decades of disconnect from our environment, decades of disconnect from how we can nurture ourselves. It will not happen overnight, but this gun of climate change is forcing people into rethinking that technology will only take us so far. What can we do about the way that we live our lives? The way I come at this, I'm just a street fighter. So if I want to get to the top of Mount Tiger. I ain't going to start on the north face because I'll never do it. I start on the lower slopes. Mm. So when I want to do it, let's start with what we've got. Let's recognize what we've got. Let's find out who's willing and able. We have, for example, got a lot of public realm in this country that is going to waste. And can you imagine in 10 years time, we'd be kicking ourselves if we weren't exploring growing food on that. We would be really mad with ourselves that we hadn't realised that we had this potential. Mm. And we can start with some communities who know how to look after themselves, communities who have come into this country through hardship we can't imagine, who have gifts that we, we've never explored. There's all sorts of stuff, but we've got to kind of stop being a victim. That's what we do with charities. That's what we do with the poor people. That No, actually, these are the real leaders of the future. Mm. In a society that can persuade people to buy bottled water, we can persuade people to live life differently. <laughs> right? This is not rocket science. And once people think, yes, I can. Mm. I am not a victim. I do not need big books to make that happen. Yeah. You know, the old... North American Indian, you can't eat money. And it's incredible what can happen once you start to see the world void of barriers. Absolutely. Because my dad expressed this really poetically the other day, which is that we have been given the greatest gift of all, which is the gift of life on this planet and the lottery of life. We've won that lottery, and yet we then navigate our lives in the 21st century focusing on the mini lotteries that we lose yeah. every day. Good point. And we need to see the world void of those barriers, void of those challenges, and reframe those problems as opportunities to reflect on the absurdity 
of so much of how we operate, exactly as you said, what are the things that we're going to look back on 50, 100 years from now and say, well, isn't that ridiculous Absolutely. that people paid for bottled water or that we had an animal agriculture system that kills 66 billion animals yeah. every year? And I think what's so exciting is exactly as you said, once you develop the eyesight and the lens for it, you begin to see these pockets of the future in the present absolutely everywhere and it only takes that little spark exactly. to ignite that movement and it, and i think we need to yeah. tell the story of individual initiative people who step up and people who say actually i can't afford to sit idly by and just watch this happen and watch this unfold because if we all default to that mindset we're going to have the same systems but that much more broken 10 20 30 years yeah. from now we need people to step up and that starts with exactly, as you said, showing up to solve these problems according to your gifts. You know, sustainability has been um, really told through the lens of sacrifice and hitting people over the head and, yeah. and trusting that if you shout at them enough, they will change their behavior. Yeah. Or making it look worthy. Stop it. Stop <laughs> exactly. It. The savior <laughs> complex, right? <laughs> and this is it. It's like actually doing what I do is such a gift and such a privilege because I love it so much. And I see that passion is so palpable in you too. I can't imagine you doing anything else no, for the no. joy and love that it brings you <laughs> as well, great. right? But when people think it's all too hard, I think of two things. I think in this country of the National Health Service, I think of Aniron Bevan. I think of what he saw in the valleys in Wales where people couldn't afford to save people they loved. And he said, that's not good enough. Right now, with all the issues that we've been talking about, that was a moment in history where we were at our best. The other one is the Rochdale pioneers, nine miles from where I live. Ordinary people who worked in factories who didn't have money, didn't have enough money to look after their own said, we will start to buy collectively. And it happened at a moment, this is what we have to understand. It didn't happen because some Martian came down with some book that he wrote. You know, no, it happened because a family or two or three families sat around a table and said, you buy a sack of grain and I'll buy a sack of something else and we'll split it and it'll save us money. And that became the international cooperative movement mm. that we should still all be proud of. It didn't just happen. It was ordinary people. It didn't happen because of a law. It happened because people said, we're going to do it differently. And then the law came in. Mm. We need a right to grow on our own public realm. Why shouldn't we have a right to do that? We, there is there's stuff along the way that the people in charge of the big books, the big board tables, can, can do to get out of the way of the ordinary citizen taking responsibility for building a kind of world. When you start asking for help and when you start inviting people, it is so wonderfully uplifting and surprising how many people just want to help. Yes. You know, in those positions of power and how many of them are desperate to make a difference but just don't know where or how to start. So many people left, right and center in really unexpected places have lifted you up and supported you and been your That's champion. True. Who are some of those uh, unexpected heroes or unexpected champions? Well, I would have to go back to my dear doctor in Halifax. I mean, what a hero. Absolutely amazing. Um, I would have to go back to a wonderful chief exec in a lo northern local authority. She's not there anymore. Uh, a lady called Donna Hall, who introduced something into the authority called the deal. It was this concept of a new social contract. Mm. If you will volunteer more, if you will promise to be more active, if you will do this, that and the other, we'll do this. And she did it not only by, we'll pass a report and it'll all get through, but by talking every month for years and years and years to cohorts of staff of that local authority that said, you can be brave, mm. you can do it differently. We will back you because your judgment said that was the right thing to do. Mm. These are heroes. These are the building blocks of putting together the new normal that gives us a chance to live within communities that we know we have gifts to help rebuild. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that decisions have a feedback loop at the point of impact mm. on the ground. And that's why 
not every decision should automatically be made locally, but a hell of a lot more should. Because you are unlikely to do something that would pollute a local watercourse if you lived in the area of that watercourse. You were unlikely mm. to want to build houses in a floodplain if you lived in an area where you've seen people flood, as I have in the north of England. You are more likely to get those nuances and put that extra resource in yourself that makes all the difference mm. to making people's life good if you live in that locality. So... There are a million different ways that you can engage in this, but it all comes down to one thing, which is you've just got to say, right, I'm stepping up to the plate. I'll give you a small example of something that was really interesting. I don't know if you know uh, Sarah Corbett. Mm -mm. Okay, so Sarah is a wonderful young woman, lives in London. She's from Everton. And she started a movement called Craftivism. And I'm not taking any, uh, you know, it's not a big secret. <laughs> it would be pointless of doing it if it was. But basically, she gets folks around a table and she sews. She teaches them to sew. Right now, the, she doesn't teach them to sew. There's loads of sewing machines and they're all making their own skirts and all the rest of it. She just gets people sewing. And why? Because actually, there's something disarming about that sewing together. Mm -hmm. You're not eyeballing each other. You're just having a chat while your eyes are down here. But I'm going to give you an example of how it works. So there was a company that um, needed to bring in the minimum wage or the living wage. They weren't going to do it. So Sarah took it over. So what she did, she found the list of their board members. She found out everything that she needed, she could find out about the individuals as human beings on that board. She matched a sewer with an individual. And... Each individual created a handkerchief or some small gift in the color that they knew that person liked or with a motif that that person liked or whatever. They then went to the AGM. And at the AGM, they went on the stage and they gave the gifts to the board members and asked them, this was their gift to them, could they think about it? Now, actually, that was so disarming, they brought it in. Mm, wow. that simple I am a human being I'm asking you as a human being do you understand that mm. you don't have to follow the pack you can make a different decision really simple now none of these things are easy P the planet going into nosedive is not easy but it's going to be a bloody sight better if we all kind of like work out what we can do that's positive and give it up mm. that's all that I know just do it and you you can't afford to like ignore that inner voice because it will just keep eating away at you yeah. and it reaches that point where either in the middle of the night or you're having a conversation with someone and you're like, oh my God, like I can't live with myself without doing this thing. <laughs> you know, it's so palpable. Right at the beginning when I kind of made up this three spinning plates malarkey and the business plate was always important to me. Because if we wanted to engage folks who didn't have trust funds to live on, mm. there needed to be jobs in this somewhere for them. They needed to be able to imagine that their children could have a future in this field. So um, it was really important to me to then um, say, okay, so how do, how do we, without any infrastructure, support what I call a sticky money economy, mm. where the profit stays where you've spent your money. Hmm. Small markets. Not, it doesn't go economy. to the Caymans. It doesn't go out to some multinational somewhere in the States. It stops with the farmer, yeah, with the cheesemaker, with the baker or whatever it might be. What can I do to encourage people with no money? So I created a campaign which just made me laugh, which was called Every Egg Matters. And the reason I can, created it was that I could not imagine turning around an entire economy. But I could imagine taking one product and increasing the sales. And from that, saying, well, if you did it for an egg, you could do it for milk. If you did it for milk, you could do it for bread. If you did it for bread, you could do it for cheese, it's right? A gateway. Mm -hmm. Right? So eggs was just an easy one. So we got, uh, we, do, we drew up uh, a stylized map of Todmorden with the roads leading into it. And we put blobs on it when we knew people were selling 
eggs at the farm, uh, not the farm gate. We're not, we're not a f- town full of farmers, but, you know, at the end of their track or whatever it was. And there was kind of like maybe 10 at the beginning. And we, there, uh, by the time we'd finished 30, 40, 50, there was a lot more on it. And the bottom line is it's just about understanding human nature because... We started that buzz. We talked about supporting local farmers and their free-range eggs. And what happened then was people would go into shops and say, is this from Tubman? Is this from a Tubman and farm? Can I? So, so then you start to get a buzz around mm. that local farm where they can actually see that the hens actually are free-range and not kept in a barn or whatever else it might be. So that then helped the farmers start to think, well, there might be money in this. I'll up the flocks of free range birds so then all the time you're bending the market away from what was battery at that time mm. through to free range that's got to be a step in the right direction and then from that other people started to get the bus and they'd come in and they'd open market stalls and they'd do local food whatever it might be and from that people started to recognize that they wanted to support local food they wanted to support small farmers they wanted to support local provenance they wanted to know what what conditions those animals? They wanted to know that, mm. and that meant by the time we'd finished, the town of Todmorden, which never particularly thought about where its food came from, started to think about where its food came from. Mm. You know, five, six, seven years on, cafe selling local food, branded with local milk, selling. You, we have, in Todmorden, fifteen thousand people, working class market town. We have got three. R- absolutely fantastic bakers proper bakers that have set up that sell in our town make the most brilliant proper bread Mm. right in a town that size that's incredible and they're all young people and they're all really keen about it and and it's a lifestyle and they're never going to make a million but they're happy and they're Mm. having conversations and they're they're helping people taste what bread should taste like mm. and they're bringing on apprenticeships and there's jobs in it and they're showing people how to make it at home that could happen everywhere it's incredible it is incredible <laughs> <laughs> so much of what you do is embedded in community connection collaboration mm. and tribe what was your first step in moving from this being a one woman show to a grassroots movement well I want to see my mate Mary No, Mary is the best community networker. You know, she is the best community networker. She's just fantastic. It was obvious we had to create propaganda gardens because you need to demonstrate what you're talking about. Mm. And if you want to demonstrate fast, there's nothing faster than clearing a spot and planting some herbs in it. I mean, it's just it just happens <laughs> overnight. So the first thing I did was get off the train and say, Mary, are you up for it? I had no idea what was going to happen. The second thing I did within two weeks was have a public meeting in a local cafe uh, and we put signs up and um, we brought to it the cook from the local high school, wonderful chap who wanted to to sell, to sell cook local food for his kids. A guy who was interested in hydroponics, that was a bit, you know, left of field as it were, but he, he was interested in food and me. So we basically put a, a, a call out put up some posters, didn't do anything trendy with social media, don't, you know, 11 years ago and I'm old. Um, and But we didn't talk about sustainability mm. and we didn't talk about climate change. We said, do you want a better future for your kids? Mm. Do you want to have local jobs for your kids? And in a town of 15,000 people that is not particularly trendy or wasn't, 60 people turned up in this cafe. And it's a long time ago, but I will never forget it. There was kind of a stillness in the air for about two or three seconds, that was it. And then... It just exploded. And people just started to talk to each other about it. So that was when I kind of had a feeling we might be onto something. But I never thought beyond the local town at that stage. And then what happened, of course, we did it. And, and this is the serendipity. You have to believe in serendipity. So at that meeting was a local reporter who subsequently went on to do an environment degree, who completely got it. She got that we weren't just growing veg. We were growing people's ability to live well and prosper in the future. But we were doing it through veg. Mm. Um, And she wrote a piece in the local rag, and it happened to go on the front page. That was picked up by the Yorkshire Post, 
who happened to do a piece. That was picked up by Hugh Fernley Whittenstall, who happened to come and talk to us about just get on and do it. Now, none of that was planned. None of that was asked for. And it was amazing. Each individual, whether it was, you know, the reporter or the bigger reporter or the people who picked up the story for you, were all doing their bit to tell a story about we can live life differently. Mm. And after that, it kind of just, so I just like go all over the shop and I'll just talk anywhere. <laughs> and other folks will just talk anywhere. We've got the most amazing website that's been created because we've had to create a core of people and we've been blessed by some funding to, to help us do that. So these wonderful people have created a fantastic resource for ordinary folks in their community to have a look about how to be, become an incredible edible group and how simple it is mm. and how to connect with other people and how to feel that they're not alone and how to understand that when the snows came to Ilfracombe, a little village in, in North Devon, and the people were completely cut off, that the folks in the Incredible Edible became part of the solution for feeding people and connecting people and getting them through hard times. And that was never in a master plan, business plan that said, by year three, this milestone would happen. This is just about trusting people mm. to believe in themselves when you give them the tools and when you tell them the stories and when you listen to their stories and mm. when you share their stories. But what we need to do the legacy from now on in is to help more people believe in themselves, to just inspire each and every one of us to recognize our gifts and not be shy in offering them up, mm. to recognize those people in the community who have the skill sets to challenge status quo but are a bit frightened about it, mm. for us to say, don't be frightened, you, you know, we can do this. To help those people in those major institutions meet the citizen halfway instead of letting the system create the block. Mm. And then ultimately, with a population of ordinary folks who believe that they have a gift and they can create something better for their children, to then say, right, it's time now for us to rethink how we spend our public money on what we buy, rethink how we build. Let's stop building health centres and hospitals that are surrounded by prickly plants that you can't eat, when the natural thing to do would be to set them in orchards and places where you could forage for food. Mm. Why wouldn't you do that? This is not rocket science. And yeah. every time you say these millions of little examples of how you could do it differently, people go, oh, yeah. We just got to start doing it. It's very uh, liberating on some level when we begin to shift to this story of adaptation mm. because the climate and ecological crisis goes from being something that is isolated to solar panels and polar bears to being an invitation for redemption and for rewriting social contracts and Absolutely. reconnecting and you know fixing problems of mental health and ensuring that people do have a sense of belonging rather than isolation. It's an invitation to readdress so many parts of how we live and breathe and exist in the 21st century. Absolutely. How do we better tell that story? Well, I think we just need to get out there and tell it. You know, and it, it's kind of funny because I kind of do this, you know, I mean, I live and breathe it. I do other things as well, but th this kind of like, it's me. It's, it's in my DNA. And... um I'll bet it was only a few years ago. It certainly wasn't at the beginning that I thought, Shh, this is adaptation, you fool. <laughs> Get a grip. You know, because, because of course, by telling the positive story, we've got that guy from Sheffield growing food in the desert. We are mitigating mm -hmm. as well. And we've not relied on technology. Yeah. Let's not get bogged down yeah. with these sophisticated name tags about stuff. We've got problems. We haven't respected all species. We, we, we've we created a culture of greed and consumption. All right, all that is true. So what are we going to do about it? 
So what are we going to do about it? And we start by living our lives differently and we start by building a different type of prosperity and we start by using our gifts differently. And that is adaptation, full stop. Mm. And in the process, yes, we'll plant loads and loads of trees. Yeah, we'll do that. And we're never going to be able to plant enough trees if we feel that we can't get out of bed because it's too depressing to even start to do anything. And we've just got to get away from a mindset of we can only do it if somebody gives it to us. We can only do it if we win the lottery. We can only do it if we save up enough Tesco stamps to do it. Or what? Forget that. If you've got anything in your bottom drawer, if you've got any pound in your pocket, if you've got anything, just plant a tree. It's one of the most powerful reframes I have ever heard is insert problem here and then what are we going to do about it? How often do we end on that note of and this is what we're going to do about it. And this is a call to action. And this is how you can get involved. That's why what you're doing is so important. I mean, it is the <laughs> most important thing. It is so important that we harness your talents and young people like you and even old people like me that could do stuff like that. Um, it's so important because you just... Like, I'm not going to do cynicism, but cynicism rules okay and it's a really bad thing mm. because that is another debilitating blooming. Mm. illness and I love what you were saying about you know the world is very much a 7.6 billion piece puzzle in which everyone has a place and it's discovering what that little place is and something that really excites me beyond just igniting young people to start their own initiatives and organizations and doing the grandiose kind of glamorous side of it is really imbuing a kind of filter through which you see your impact and role in the world and mm. how to make people much more conscious citizens. Mm. So then rather than kind of unsubscribing from your own impact or influence and saying, oh, what I do doesn't matter, what I do doesn't have an impact, actually really owning mm. your impact and your ripple effect mm. so that when you do go shopping and you decide to go into the supermarket, you're connected to the person who grew that on the other side of the world and you have a think about their life and what you sure. purchasing that product means. Or if you do go shopping on High Street, thinking, who was it that crafted this jumper? Mm. Who was it that was responsible for bringing this into my life? Mm. And how am I supporting that system? And is this decision supportive or conducive to a future that I want to create mm. and the future that I want to be able to inherit? And that is an empowering thing. Absolutely. It's completely bonkers that... Um, We've kind of been browbeaten into we don't have any rights and and our voice doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. There's loads of reasons around education and all manner of things that, that why that is a dominant reality. And yet there are people who can say, no, I can do it differently. Mm -hmm. And surely with the power of social media and, you know, alternative channels of information, surely if ever there was a time to unite around the positive mm. with force and influence, surely it's got to be no. Mm. Surely it's got to be no. Um, so the challenge is back to you, kid. Because <laughs> I'm rubbish at IT. Pam, in your own life, you've had to overcome barriers and you've looked in the face of adversity when are moments where you've had to kind of navigate your own self-limiting beliefs or at what points have you had to confront the voice that says you're not experienced enough or not smart enough? We all have those inner gremlins. Mm. When was the last time you remember really encountering one and how did you have a conversation with it or reconcile it? The only time I feel inadequate is when I am playing to somebody else's tune. You know, you can struggle with trying to make sense of things until you realize that when you sing your tune, you don't have those problems. You never have those problems. I have had deep moments of challenge around things when the way that I thought we should be going has been challenged by people who apparently knew more than me. Mm -hmm. And I just, and that has left me so despondent. And I've gone home and I've thought about it and I've had a chat with the cats and whatever. And I've come to the view no, I'm picking myself up. We're, we're carrying on. We're, we're going on. Because 
I only have a very small, simple truth, which is we can be part of a solution, not the problem. That's my simple truth. You just need to get out of our way and let us get on with it. So what you're saying is you don't make it about yourself oh. because you're in service of something that is much, much bigger. You focus on the solutions rather than the problems. Absolutely. You invite other people in. Yeah. You play to your strengths and you help ignite gifts in other people and help them discover what those innate gifts are. So all it is to it. A lot of the young people that I've worked with who have gone through the education system feel really stupid when they come out of it because instead of being told to play to those strengths and to follow their curiosities and foster their courage and the thing that makes them uniquely them, they've been told to become a set of averages and conform to a standardized testing system that pegs them against their mm. peers. Mm. Now, Howard Gardner talks about lots of different types of intelligence, everything from interpersonal, your ability to relate to others, through to intrapersonal, how you're able to tune in with yourself, through to naturalistic, mm. right? Our ability to connect to the natural world and discern different species. We each have all of these different types of intelligence. And yet so often we're deprived of the opportunity mm. to really, really discover what they are and hone them. Yeah what's your kind of toolkit for helping bring out other people's light and help amplify their gifts? If I was going to create a legacy, the first step of that legacy is to inspire people to believe in themselves. And the best way that I know to do that is through storytelling, through through creativity, you know, through through things other than a tick box mentality. But actually, I, I'm throwing a challenge out. At the moment, I'm throwing a challenge out. Do you want to come and help me create the biggest inspirational program that we've ever seen to help people just know they have it in them to build something better than we've got? Mm -hmm. That they have it in them right? to, to fall off the wall and they will be caught mm -hmm. by people who care. I'm not a Minister of Education and... You know, I haven't been an ex-chief exec of Unilever. But what I have got is friends and people in 150 groups across the UK. Why would I not start building inspirational programs around those groups, attracting people to what's already there? Why would I not start there? And then why wouldn't that be 200 and 500 and 1,000? Why not? Mm. So small steps, small actions, none too insignificant to make a difference. That's the, that's the trick. And then, uh, <laughs> climate change, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? Mm. But find like-minded people and try and, and... And the greatest joy is when there's young people like you. Mm. The greatest joy, you know, because you are the hope. Not all people like me, although... <laughs> I might do a few things before I've finished, but yeah. I think the magic happens when we bring both together. Absolutely, without a doubt. And I believe in magic.